green room yeah. talk. That's the bonus. <clears throat> All right. So let's go ahead and get started. Um, welcome, everybody, to this talk show with Joseph Michelli, celebrated author and uh, the author of this book that we're talking about today, Stronger Through Adversity. This book is hot, hot off the press. It uh, just came out within the past few weeks. And um, it's really an inspirational guide to leadership in any circumstance. But it's especially a useful guide during tough circumstances. And it also includes application exercises to strengthen your leadership skills. So I'm really uh, glad to have you all here today. And I'd like to welcome you by uh, just uh, suggesting that you ch type into the chat where you're calling in from and a leadership trait that you have appreciated from someone that has been a leader to you in a tough situation. So uh, go ahead and just type that in if you would. And uh, I'm going to be trying to unmute people as we go along. Um, in this uh, show today, it's a group conversation. Uh, feel free to speak up anytime you want if you'd like to ask a question or you feel free to type a question or a comment in the chat. Um, I uh, want to let you know a little bit more about Joseph Michelli. Uh, you probably already know that he has written a lot of books and uh, really uh, digging into what has been the success factor uh, the set of success factors for a variety of companies that are doing tremendous things in the area of treating customers well, being good leaders, and being successful. Um, so Joseph, uh, you also do a lot of uh, speeches with companies. Uh, tell us a little bit more about your consultancy, if you would. Well, first off, I'm a fan of yours, Lynn. So that's the only credential that's relevant, I think, here today. Um, it's great to be with somebody who I think is a transformational change expert in the field of customer experience. My journey is through a PhD in organizational development at USC. Uh, and no, I did not get a scholarship based on any connections from my family. Um, but beyond USC, I worked for the Pike Place Fish Market in Seattle, Washington, uh, where they throw fish as an engaging customer experience phenomena. And from that wrote a book, which led me to work with Starbucks and write a book. And you can see kind of how it went from there. Um, and this is a real pivot. Like as we talk today about stronger through adversity, it's, it's not CX focused to customer experience focused as much as it is. How do we adapt uh, and learn and lead uh, in a post pandemic world? Oh, wonderful. Um, this book is really based on about 140 interviews and uh, statements that were sent to you from people in public safety, uh, nonprofit organizations, businesses of all types. And, um, you know, you've pulled it off in less than a year, probably like six months, it seems, uh, Joseph. Um, and I really like your life's, the, the statement that you have in the book that your life story is your leadership story. Can you elaborate on that? Sure, so I, uh, I was actually working on a book for Godiva Chocolate. I'd consulted for them for years and, and uh, I knew Annie Young Scribner, their CEO, because she used to be over at Starbucks. And uh, I was working with her about February, all of a sudden everything kind of turned and I wasn't gonna be going to their plant and I wasn't gonna be going to their new cafe concepts in New York City. So it was clear I needed to go somewhere else, fortunately, my life story has been one of consulting with a lot of leaders in this space and getting to know a lot of leaders. So as I was on task forces early in March, I started to ask some of those leaders, how are they approaching this challenge? Kind of a daunting first of its kind for many of them in their lifetime. And I was also observing really different leadership styles. So uh, I saw people who were clinging to participatory management and decisions were slow. I saw people panicked and impulsive and decisions were rapid without any customer analytics, for example. So with all that, I, uh, I started to jump into this. And I think what became really clear is that people who were transparent, who knew their, their life story, who could leverage their past victories and failures and successes and angst, were more effective than those who were not very self-aware and thus couldn't leverage their talents and opportunities. And sometimes it's just your deficits that are the thing you need to be most aware of because it gives, gives you access to people who are different than you who can supplement those, those gaps. All right. So uh, 
Can you also just uh, give us the, the nutshell on your life story is your leadership story? I think, you know, it, it ties into that. I think it's that self-awareness of who you are and bringing that to the forefront. I mean, really, what is it that you have encountered that you can call back on? You know, truly, this pandemic was unprecedented. That word has kind of been overused, but there are precedents for resilience. We, you know, everything we do is is unprecedented. We've never seen exactly that constellation of events coming at us in that way. But we have to know who we are and what we have endured and where we have something to draw from that is relevant and applicable to the circumstance. Right. I think you mentioned um, uh, kind of a dis discussion about the word unprecedented and how it's been overused, but maybe this is an an opportunity for us to rise to unprecedented growth and uh, sustained success. Yeah, you know, I, I often hear people pining for the new, you know, for the old normal. Whenever they talk about the new normal, we heard the word Zoom in ways we'd never heard before and unprecedented and a variety of other phrases. And I think it's time for a new normal. It's time for us to take what happened in this last protracted period of time, at least a year now, uh, and come out better for it, not just try to revert back to 2019. There are a lot of learnings here, and we went through hell to learn them. So we should be able to, to take them forward uh, with some nobility. Amen on that. I was also excited to see this quote that you included from Gandhi, that strength does not come from winning. Your struggles develop your strengths. When you go through hardships and decide not to surrender, that is strength. Can you tell us a little bit about the uh, interviews that touched on that particular statement? Yeah, I think, you know, I'll, I'll share quickly from myself, you know, my best year of my life is the worst year of my life. It's very Dickens-like, Dickens right? Uh, my wife died uh, at age 51. My mother died three months later on Father's Day. Uh, my wife wasn't there to help me cope with my mom. I know that that year was a test of my character. It revealed character for me. And that was the, the, that was a phraseology I heard over and over again from leaders, that this was the crucible. This was the tempering force. This is where their legacy was forged. There were lots of different variations of it, but I think it all circled back to as much as we would never wish this upon anyone, it, it, it darkened our door. So now what, and how did you show up? Well, uh, I think that uh, we all have our own version of that in whatever uh, circumstances that we each were in, all of the listeners on this show. Um, now in your book, you have uh, for each chapter, a breath of insight, a resilience recap, and your strength plan that's complete with uh, exercises for self-reflection, discussions with others, and application to your leadership, your family, and your business. Uh, I really appreciated those elements of your book in each chapter. Um, could you tell us a little bit about the layout here, how you have these five sections? So I have a terrific editor at McGraw-Hill. I've been writing for them now. It's my 10th book, I think. And, and the constant voice in my head is, bring it back to the reader, bring it back to the reader. How is this relevant for a dry cleaner in Poughkeepsie, right? Um, so I think I'm always, when I'm writing, I'm thinking about how is it relevant for that person or for most anyone to have access to it. So something like set the foundation, you know, really this is about, did you put your mask on first? Did you, and I'm not talking about the controversial face covering, I'm talking about an oxygen mask as referenced by flight attendants pre-flight. Did you put that on so that you were self, there was self-care involved and you could take care of others for the marathon? Um, and so I'm, I'm thinking about what, how do I ask those questions? How do I get people to think about, you know, self-care is not selfish and, uh, and, and other topics that are brought on in the book, whether that's, you know, adaptivity or it's change readiness or it's legacy considerations. Right. So um, each one of these uh, sections actually has about four chapters, four or five chapters, I think. So um, it's a really useful way of uh, introducing uh, these 140 interviews and covering all the, the uh, nuggets of wisdom that they come that they uh, shared with us. Could you uh, share a favorite story from a favorite section? 
Yeah, this is always hard, Lynn. It's like, which of your kids do you love most, right? Uh, there's 140 people like Hans Vesberg, the CEO of Verizon, and Brian Cornell, the CEO of Target, um, players from Mercedes-Benz and Ritz-Carlton and Starbucks, some of my companies that I've worked with before. But my favorite story is from a nurse who uh, is in charge of a major hospital in Los Angeles where they have just been blitzkrieg. She worked you know, 60 days in a row as a leader, could never break herself away from uh, the front lines, terrible self-care. She's very insightful about it, very honest and candid about the choices she made and some of the impacts it had on her kids. It went on, she goes on though and talks about how powerless she was sometimes as a leader and that all you can do sometimes as a leader is to just be present. And I think we sometimes get service confused with doing things for, Sometimes we get it right and we realize we don't only have to do things for, we can empower people to do for themselves. Sometimes it's about listening. Sometimes it's just about being in the physical space with somebody. And so she would talk about nurses who were in the intensive care unit with dying patients from COVID who were literally shaking and in tears as they held their iPads up so that family members could say their final words to the dying patient. And in that you could just see just massive compassion and an awareness of service at a level that is nonverbal. And to me, that's a story that I always relate to because sometimes as a guy, I like to just go in and fix stuff. And so for me, it's a very humbling reminder that when most of the time just being present is one of the greatest gifts I can give. You know, that brings to mind the fact that leadership is not necessarily just at the top of an organization. Leadership can be at any level, and even among those who don't have anyone reporting to them, uh, we lead um, to our peers and the people that we serve as our internal customers or external customers or, or what, what have you. And um, most everybody is involved in something where they uh, set an example for others. And I suppose that uh, all of the lessons learned here can apply to anyone in any of those situations. Yeah, it's one of the reasons I'm a fan of yours. I think you've constantly pushed our field to think about, you know, leading this customer experience space. Who are our customers? They are our peers. People are watching us. They are our communities. And I, I hope, you know, when I, when I wrote this book, I did not include any political leaders. The only exception is Carly Fiorina. She used to be the, you know, the CEO of HP. Uh, she did run for president in 2016. So she would be my, my quasi political leader, but for all practical intents and purposes, I stayed clear of politicians. I did not want to get into people who had huge elements of self-interest in their leadership. So I did talk to police chiefs and fire chiefs and they were talking about the pandemic, but they were also talking about civil unrest and plenty of other things going on. And I also, I got a real sense from smaller business leaders. I have a few of those in there that they were just out there in their community trying to make a difference and, and keep things moving. So I, I hope that this book is, is for that dry cleaner in Poughkeepsie and for somebody who's just trying to lead in their family. Um, it strikes me that there are a lot of similarities and parallels between this book and some of your previous books. Um, how would you draw that, uh, that out for our listeners? Yeah, I, you know, I think those of us in the customer experience space think uh, everything is related to human experience, right? I mean, we are in the business of constantly being of service to others and finding ways to elevate the way we serve. So I think that is endemic to leadership and so it carries on and legacy is something i think about as a you know in a customer experience space i think listening and communicating effectively uh and in aligned ways are all relevant to to cx what you don't see in here is any talk about customer journey mapping or any of those kind of things but there's a lot about customer analytics in here because people were just trying to get their arms around formal and informal listening to employees and customers early on in the pandemic, so they had any kind of direction on where they were gonna take their organization. You know, that's why I really think that this is a book for all times, not just uh, until the pandemic is over and then we wouldn't look at this book. I really felt like it's um, informative for, for everything because we should have already been hypersensitive to customers' voice and to employees' voice. We should have already been on a quest to digitalize and to 
smooth silos and to make sure that our processes weren't uh, you know broken and uh, and loopy which you know really came out in March and April uh, with even the best of companies um, you know uh, there is a a quote from uh, one of the, the uh, people in your book that's talking about a map and how you know normally you you follow a, a defined map of here's how to, how to how to be a leader or here's how to be um, successful in business or in life uh, as a, in, our, in your community or whatever uh, you're pursuing but then when there is no map follow the train <laughs> Yeah, so I, you know, I think this may have come a bit from me in that um, I, you know, I was inspired, heaven forbid I've ever been inspired by the words of Mike Tyson before, but he did say that everybody has a plan until they get punched in the mouth, right? So that was a helpful framing and starting point for the book, because I think a lot of us did have a plan, and we all took a ubiquitous punch in the mouth. What I realized is that when your plan doesn't work anymore, and a lot of leaders talked about how panicked they were because they had a great strategic plan on December 31st, you know, 2019, that seemed not relevant by March 15th of 2020. When they panicked in that time, how did they get their bearings? And so I have climbed 14,000 foot peaks in Colorado. That was kind of one of my, my hobbies. And, and I, early in my climbing career, people told me, if you ever have a map and it doesn't match up to what you're seeing coming at you, go with the terrain. So I tried to leverage that metaphor around customer listening, slowing things down, watching uh, with you, you know, listening with your eyes, observing your customers and your employees, pulse surveying, all those kind of things to get us to a place that we could trust because you couldn't trust your map. It was irrelevant. Yeah, I think that contingency planning was a, a real uh, you know, wake up call for everybody uh, that we don't have contingency plans for the most part. Um, surely uh, for risk management um, in the case of an, an earthquake or a hurricane or something like that, uh, companies tend to have um, some safeguards. But for the rank and file, for your you know typical marketing plan, for example, um, the, the contingency plan is something that's on the checklist, but it's usually last. It's usually when we're exhausted and we don't really care and we're so invested that we can't think of, uh, you know, a worst case scenario or alternatives, surely, you know, things are going to go lick, lickety split and, uh, you know, we'll succeed. But when a monkey wrench is thrown in like this, uh, the contingency plan, um, essential, the, 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 the vital need for it, I think, really speaks volumes. Um, so that goes with the old saying of hope for the best and plan for the worst. Uh, do you have a story? In align with that or what, what I absolutely do and I, I think that there were plenty of leaders who talked about the fact that where they had to go very quickly was to planning on a daily basis that the notion of having a long planning horizon was pretty much gone if you did not have a contingency plan if you hadn't already been in a space where you're transforming digitally uh, you were not going to optimize it then at best you could do was pivot to it but you would just bandage something together to get you through it. Um, so assuming you didn't have all that, you hadn't contingency planned, you hadn't planned scenarios of what ifs, what if we couldn't actually deliver our services face to face with customers. If you hadn't done all that work, then the best you could do was say, okay, what are we gonna try to achieve today? Let's meet in the morning, let's align on that, let's do it today, let's debrief in the evening, let's reset our goals for tomorrow. And you know, I heard that from the head of Panasonic and I heard it from many other brands, Michelle Gass, for example, at Kohl's said, you know, she got to a point where she couldn't even believe that she was having to make plans to completely eviscerate their marketing budget when that would have been a sacred cow at all other times. Yes. So um, we uh, asked the, uh, the listeners in this show to uh, type a leadership trait that has been influential to them during tough times. And one of our listeners said that um, actively listening to employees about uh, solutions the, the company is uh, facing, you know, get, uh, anticipating and uh, eliciting inputs from uh, employees and whoever the stakeholders are is a good uh, leadership trait. 
Absolutely, one thousand percent agree. There's a there's a metaphor I use in the book. It's called lead front, middle, back, and and it's kind of playing off of horse herds in that the female alpha sire leads the herd with vision. There's a male, uh, I'm sorry, the alpha mare, and then the alpha sire, he's in the back kind of moving it along. And then there are horses in the herd that shape herd behavior. And I think a lot of what you see is that in this crisis, you need to be in the herd. You need to be right in there listening. Sometimes you need in the back and not talk. You need to be in the back of the team and say, I'm being quiet, I will speak last so that we make sure I don't mute or color or influence and that I truly solicit the input of my team. Exactly, and I think that the, there's so many ironies in what it takes to be a great leader. Uh, authenticity, humility, those were uh, mentioned by our listeners today. And uh, there's a quote in the beginning of one of your chapters by Ann Wilson Schaefe saying that, asking for help does not mean you are weak or incompetent. It usually indicates an advanced level of honesty and intelligence. So that's an irony that most of us have not been conditioned to uh, realize uh, in our society that when you ask for help, it really means uh, that you're honest, intelligent, and strong. Yeah, I'll take the sexist language out of John Donne's poet and say that no person is an island. And I would suggest that as leaders, we often get fooled into believing an illusion that we are somehow have to have the answers, that we are complete unto ourselves, that we have to feign some level of expertise that be goes beyond our competency. And that all gets us into trouble. There are plenty of examples in the book of people who humble themselves into asking for questions. A whole bunch of guys and women from Seattle got together and they did something called Challenge Seattle. They shared their zeitgeist of knowledge. Uh, they humbled themselves to not knowing things that other leaders knew, and they came out of it a lot better because of it. So I, I think that uh, the lessons are clearly there for those of us who realize we don't need to be perfect. And frankly, as you get into it and talk to a lot of the leaders that I did, they realized that if they tried to be perfect, they would be less attractive as leaders. Well, there's, that reminds me of a quote that I use so often during the 15 years that I was uh, leading customer experience transformation company-wide. And um, the chairman of Applied Materials, James Morgan, said that good news is no news, no news is bad news, and bad news is good news. And I used that so often when I was working with different groups in our company because we, we were twice as big as our next competitor. Good news was no news. Uh, we already knew those things. Um, and no news was bad news because uh, if we had our head in the sand or we weren't hearing feedback, uh, that, that uh, didn't bode well. But if we were hearing some early warning signals um, where we were taking uh, constructive feedback or uh, criticism as, um, as an early warning signal and an opportunity to uh, shift gears, to uh, course correct, uh, that would make us even stronger. And that really seemed to um, resonate with the people in that company. Got a lot of uh, PhDs and um, uh, almost rocket scientists in the uh, semi semiconductor equipment company. Um, but I think it's something that we, we haven't really given a lot of thought to in our society in terms of how do we welcome inputs from others. Absolutely. And it was, it was interesting because I, I talked to Charlie Cole. He's the chief executive officer of FTD, the floral company. And he had just gotten on the job as their CEO about three days after they went into quarantine. So he'd never met his senior leadership team. Um, you can only imagine how what it's like to take the helm at that moment in time. And he said that his mantra was no hiding bad news. Like that's all he tried to communicate. He goes, you don't know me from anyone. You have no idea how the CEO is going to react, right? But the one thing I want you to be clear of is no hiding bad news. That's the only way we can collectively work together to find solutions that are gonna create value for our team, for our, our customers, and ultimately for the survivability of our organization. How wonderful. It, risk aversion is the uh, worst enemy to innovation and creativity and um, actually even collaboration, I think. 
Which is why I think, and I talk about it in the title of a chapter called Bring Yourself to Work. It really is this sort of notion that the more, and, you know, there's an over-disclosure element to anything you do. So you have to be careful, right? But I think, you know, if I don't share parts of myself, I don't build a personal emotional connection with, with your audience, right? So if I'm trying to be very academic and staid, it doesn't, it is, this is not real. And so people need that because in my reality is a humbleness to my imperfections. And the more I disclose them with grace uh, and with a spirit of let's work on this together to align to greatness, uh, the more likely they're going to be able to share that with us as well. And we can figure out how to solve problems before they hide them. Yes. Well, I want to remind all of our listeners that you're welcome to speak up in the talk show here and ask a question of Joseph, uh, anything you're curious about this book or others, a personal uh, experience you'd like to share, uh, that's all welcome. Uh, so while people may be thinking about that, uh, Joseph, uh, can you remind us um, which uh, companies were participating in this and which uh, locales uh, were also talking uh, about their leadership uh, struggles? So yeah, so at the very high levels, you know, it's the CEOs like, like Target and, and Verizon and Michelle Guest that I've referenced already, CEO of Godiva, CEO of Mercedes-Benz, CEO of Miele, a variety of those companies, also presidents from companies like Marriott or Microsoft. We have senior leaders from Google. We have senior leaders from Southwest Airlines. Uh, and then on the, on the non Fortune 500 types, uh, we have a, a good chunk of folks in the not-for-profit space because I think leadership in that space often gets overlooked. And we just think of leaders from a for-profit perspective. So those are the, you know, the, the presidents and CEOs of United Way, uh, senior vice president of Feeding America, president and CEO of, uh, of uh, YMCA of America, senior leaders of the Humane Society. It's just, a, a, just an amazing number of people who are kind enough. And, and they talked to me. I mean, this wasn't just me sending them an email and saying, tell me what your idea is on this topic. They talked to me, they took the time. And what I found kind of interesting, I mean, I have a PhD in clinical psychology. That's my background. So I'm kind of, you know, in that mind space almost always with people, but I felt them catharting a bit. Like this was a safe opportunity for them to take a breath, think about what they were learning, admit some of the things they were scared of. Um, and they did it with such grace and, and such kindness. And so I feel like a steward of this and handing it over to other leaders to benefit because it's such a, an access point. And, and I also felt obligated to give back. So a portion of the proceeds for this book go uh, to Direct Relief, which is a global uh, nonprofit that is designed to help the front line with food and with medical supplies. Well, I can appreciate that. I uh, really love that you've thought of doing that. So I want to thank you for uh, participating in this uh, in this uh, conversation, Joseph, and uh, for telling us about these wonderful uh, stories and advice from so many people, so many walks of life. Um, I think that it's insightful um, about uh, asking for advice in hard times to show your strength as a, a leader, that uh, we can dig into this book, uh, Stronger Through Adversity, even further. So uh, imagine this is available on Amazon.com and where else would we uh, find it otherwise? Amazon, any place good books are sold is what I like to say. You can certainly go to my website at josephmagelli.com. We'll link you to uh, places, but Amazon's a perfect place to start. And, and, you know, as we wrap up, I just want to say thank you, Lynn. I, you know, I, I told you at the beginning that I'm a fan. You know, you're one of the good people in our field. And most of the people in customer experience, by the way, are really extraordinary. I'm so impressed by the colleague group that I get to work with. But I think very few people will know just how much you've dedicated to the advancement of customer experience globally and how many people have benefited from understanding the core competencies of this industry thanks to your vigilance and your nurturance. So uh, anytime you need me for anything, uh, even if I have no books on the table, just uh, if I can be of a service to you, please don't hesitate. And thank you to all of those of you who took the time today, because I know that's one of the most precious gifts you could give. So I am extremely grateful. 
Well, thank you. So please uh, visit josephmichelli.com or nuclearaction.com for more. And uh, you're always welcome to contact us individually to uh, discuss things, uh, ask for help, uh, share a story. I think we, we both uh, really welcome that with open arms.